I think we're ready to begin our April 7th, 2020 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission. Uh, Ms. Pender, is there an introductory video or, or are we not doing that right now? No. 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 Okay. No problem. All right. I would like to welcome everyone to our April 7th, 2020 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission. I'll call this meeting to order. And let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge. And the flag is not here. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's any other meeting. Okay, we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna do it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I might go get the flag. As our county commission meets this evening, our nation, our state, and our community are in the midst of a public health crisis unlike any that we have seen during our lifetimes. When our commission last met just two weeks ago on March 24th, there were 65,000 Americans that had been diagnosed with COVID-19. There are now more than 380,000 documented cases in the United States and we know the actual number of people who are sick is much higher than the number of documented cases. Before we begin our meeting this evening, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence to recognize the 12,000, approximately 12,000 people in our country who have already lost their lives to COVID-19. People may offer a silent prayer for the victims of this illness and their families. For those who are sick now, and for whom we hope for recovery, as well as for the doctors, nurses, first responders, and so many others who are working hard to care for the sick and save lives. I also ask that we, also, that we all reflect on what we can do to help slow the spread of this dangerous disease and to help our neighbors and community during this difficult time. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I would like to read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board during this meeting. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention that Commissioner Jasmine Beach Ferrara is participating in the meeting, uh, but remotely, so she's on um, the conference line and will be voting with us on the issues that we're considering this evening. All right, um, we come to the consent agenda. Are there any questions from any commissioners about any items on the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and follow the remainder of the agenda as published? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. All right, um, the first item up is um, on our agenda is an update on the COVID-19. And Dr. Jennifer Mullendore is here to present this item. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Mullendore. I have some colleagues who will be helping us as well. Great. All right. So um, we're going to give you an update on the local response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this is just an overview of what we'll cover tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk about 
what the current state is um, uh, related to case counts and testing and masks, and then um, Fletcher Tove and Taylor Jones will address the others. So um, at the time that I'm speaking to you, um, there have been a total of 36 lab-confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Buncombe County residents. 30 of those individuals have recovered from their illness and been released from isolation, and there remains one death associated with COVID-19 in a Buncombe County resident. Uh, the county is uh, developing a report with basic demographic data on the cases of COVID-19 in our community that we hope to share uh, later this week. And we know, as uh, Chairman Newman said, we know that this number of 36 cases is an underestimate of the true number of cases of COVID-19 in our community, and that results from the lack of availability of testing from the very beginning um, and the guidance from federal and state public health agencies that have um, limited who should be tested. And we know that various lab companies are making testing um, kits, testing supplies, um, more available, getting FDA authorization to, to produce their products, but there still remain limits on supplies, as well as some concerns about the accuracy and validity of the, of the testing. I do want to give kudos to our local medical community. Many um, uh, primary care providers have stepped up and are doing uh, testing in their practices. Um, using innovative like drive-through testing. We have local urgent cares who are doing testing. Um, and, uh, you know, Mission Health has, uh, has been offering testing and is changing to, to enable more rapid uh, results. So, so I thank them all for doing that. Um, but again, the current guidance from the state is to focus testing on uh, people in high-risk settings. And, um, if the guidance expands to uh, include more people who should be tested and if testing supplies become more available, it's possible that we will see um, some additional community testing sites set up uh, in the county and those sites could be run by healthcare providers um, outside of, the, um, outside of uh, Buncombe County Health and Human Services or potentially you know, by our staff. But currently our staff is focused on testing um, people with symptoms who live or work in high-risk settings, which uh, is congregate living settings like long-term care facilities, um, uh, jails, or homeless shelters. And, and the reason for that is that we know that one case in those settings could spread quickly to a very vulnerable population. And um, at this time, I just want to reiterate that, you know, it's really important that every single person in our, in our county understands that COVID-19 is here. You can't necessarily look at somebody and know that they have it. Um, and we all just need to continue to take basic steps to prevent, um, to stay safe ourselves and prevent spread of the infection through the community. And the number one thing um, that we continue to tell people is keep yourself, keep ourselves and the people we live with away um, from having close physical contact with people who don't live with us, right? And keeping that six feet of physical distance from others is critically important. That, that's, the, that's the game changer at this point. It's critically important um, to keep preventing spread um, and slowing the spread of the virus. Uh, and again, based on the, the orders that have come down from the governor and, and locally, uh, limiting non-essential travel um, trying to stay home as much as possible. Continue to hand washing. There will never be a time when public health doesn't encourage hand washing and uh, cleaning and disinfecting high, frequently touched surfaces. Uh, and over the, the weekend, um, you know, evidence has come forth that we know that people can look and feel healthy but have COVID-19 infection and be spreading it to others. And so the CDC now recommends that um, the general public wear cloth face coverings in public settings where it can be difficult to keep that six foot social, you know, that distance from others. And so that could be places like when you're going out grocery shopping or going to the pharmacy. And so there are instructions on the CDC website and our website has a link to, to those instructions for how to make one um, at home 
and uh, we want to remember that we want to keep surgical masks and the N95 respirators. We want to make sure those go to healthcare personnel and to medical first responders who are taking care of COVID-19. And there are um, efforts in our community for where people can donate those supplies if they have them. And so again, I want to thank people for who have done so. And I want to thank our community. I really feel like our community has stepped up to work together um, to address this very significant public health threat. And, and I think it's really important that each of us know that we have a role in this and everything we do um, does make a difference in protecting um, the health of our community. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Fletch. Good evening, Fletch Tove, um, Public Health Emergency Preparedness Director. So first, I'd like to talk about um, our stay home, stay safe declaration. As you know, that went into effect uh, Thursday, March 26th at 8 p.m. and is set to expire as, as planned at 6 a.m. on Thursday, April 9th. Um, at that point in time, we have a superseding declaration that we've uh, pushed you guys for review, a draft of that, that will go into effect. And the intent of that is that at 6 a.m. when our last declaration expires, that one will go into effect and we'll be adopting several of the sections from the governor's emergency order number 121. Um, in general, that's going to give some broader definitions and more opportunity for the community, but there are some notable exceptions where we will be maintaining more strict enforcement of mitigation measures locally. Um, and then on top of those stricter measures we have in place, we also have some more extensive measures that will be put into effect locally. Um, but that, that, that planned transition will be uh, announced tomorrow, Wednesday at 4 p.m. at a media community update. We'll go through that extensively. And there, again, there will be interpretive, an interpretive document and guidance to accompany that to go, go into further detail about how those, um, how, what that will look like into the future. And that's, that doesn't have an expiration date. It's until rescinded or modified. And uh, we know the governor's executive order right now is set to expire at the end of the month. And we're expecting that he'll also review that and probably extend that at that time. Um, and then I now I want to transition and talk to uh, next steps and what the, you know, the rest of spring and summer might look like for us. Uh, as we're looking at models, um, there's two major models, prediction models we're looking at right now. You may have seen these in the news. The one is from the Institute of Medical Health Metrics, and the other is um, from RTI International um, in North Carolina. Um, they, they're similar in some ways, but the big divergence between the two is when they estimate us entering our peak phase. The uh, Medical Health Metrics and Evaluation Model predicts that maybe as early as April 13th, North Carolina will enter its peak phase, whereas the RTI International model, which was just released um, this week, says that you know we may be looking at peak phase starting mid-May to late May. But I think what's important to understand there is that while they diverge, we're talking about peak phases. These aren't single days where everything starts getting better, and that phase may last. You know, some models show between four to ten weeks. Um, Part of the reasons for the difference between these two models is the way they weigh and assess uh, physical distancing policies implemented across the state. And um, we can expect as we get more data to their, for the projections to converge as we get closer to that period. But the, the reasonable conclusion that can be drawn from all these models is that the physical distancing measures we have in place are vital and that to some extent or in some form, we need to keep them in place through April and well into May. And unfortunately, we just don't have enough data at this time to know the extent of the impact of COVID-19. But once we have a better idea, um, we're gonna, as we look to move into less restrictive measures, less restrictive measures, we're evaluating what we're calling an adaptive response. This means we'll loosen our measures, but be prepared at short notice to quickly re-implement some of the physical distancing controls, as we've seen, um, leading indicators for virus transmission, healthcare capacity, and public health preparedness be affected. So I just want to, for the community to be, to be in the mindset that when we're seeing in the news, we keep talking about peak, peak days, that the mindset is this is going on throughout the summer and well into to fall. So 
this may continue you know, through the rest of the year, these measures that we have to implement. And I'll turn it over to uh, Taylor Jones. Good evening, commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Taylor Jones. I'm the emergency services director. And I'd like to give you an update from the standpoint of our emergency operations center. The activities in response for COVID-19. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to acknowledge all our partners. Our partners have worked diligently to successfully stand up an emergency operations center. And these are our many partners that we bring to the table that are listed here, which includes our school districts, it includes all of our municipalities. Everybody has been working together in a unified effort uh, to actually prepare our community for this event. And they've done an outstanding job. The schools and feeding our kids, our fire departments and coming together in the Emergency Operations Center with all of our other municipality partners, AB Tech, has done astounding work in training our alternate workforce so that you know you've seen in New York how the uh, workforce in EMS was reduced by 50 percent and law enforcement reduced by 50 percent reduced in fire departments by 61 percent so I use that as a leading indicators to project out what could happen here so with that kind of planning and pre-planning and all of us working together uh, AB Tech's done a phenomenal job in doing just-in-time training for our emergency medical response team where we've repurposed county workers and trained them how to be ambulance drivers and provide them with EMR training. Uh, that has been phenomenal for our workforce. But the other thing, say we never use them, but now we've got, say, 30 employees trained up across the county. So when an incident happens in the county, we've got quicker response. You know, that's kind of out of thinking, uh, out of the box that our public safety workers and our county's been doing. Going to our next slide here, I would like to share some of the EOC's accomplishments. And they're too no numerous to really put up here. But I've hit a high level, executive level for y'all to review and to understand that we started out with just a simple request of how are we going to maintain child care when these first responders are out and working. So the YMCA's, the school districts, they all stepped up in a partnership to help take care of our first responders. We've set up uh, isolation and quarantine sites for not only our first responders that may be exposed, but also for the public. And so these are being used throughout the community. Our hotels have stepped up, community centers have stepped up, AB Tech and UNC Asheville have stepped up in a huge way for alternate care centers. I've been working with those folks in the Corps of Engineers all day for alternate hospital care and surge capabilities, and they're doing outstanding work uh, in pulling all this together so that we've got a model that encompasses this kind of planning. The other thing I believe that we've done, I, I've got to give kudos to our IT department. They've stood up a virtual EOC where we've done things through distance uh, that has been amazing. And we've been able to track that and keep up with what we're doing. And we reported that back to all of our players every day in the situational reports. The situational reports have tied up, you know, exactly where we're at and how we've been moving forward. So I've been really proud of how all that has come together. <clears throat> I would be so remiss if I didn't thank all of our faith-based organizations that stepped up, our VOADs, all the folks with Rachel's group that, from the county that stepped up, from our shelters working to feed folks, to maintain homeless care. Outreach in our community has been phenomenal. I've been doing emergency services work for 35 years. And I have never seen a community step up this huge and be this amazing. <clears throat> so if we go to our next slide, when we talk about the long-term care facilities, one of the things that I think has happened here, 
that's also kind of been unprecedented is how our lawn care facilities have basically shut down and started a process, even when EMS comes into care, they're taking people's <clears throat> temperatures, they're doing wellness checks, making sure everybody's okay. We go into the facility, we come out. We've checked this through the fire marshal's office. We've also checked some of our shelters this way, and everybody is doing this. I think that's why our numbers have stayed so low compared to the other parts. I think the stay at home, stay safe. I think all the pro actions that the long-term care facilities, the shelters have taken, they've worked together for us. It's been such a great community effort. You've heard me say that this is a marathon. There's more work to be done. Like Fletcher Tobe just said, we're looking at this possibly going into next year. So as we plan for that, and we plan for those activities, we got to unify as a county. We've got to get behind our first responder community. We've got to get behind the needs and the unprecedented things that we're going to be faced with uh, and let those folks know that we've got their backs. I know we're unified. We've shown that. But when you look ahead what Washington, New York has done, what we're doing here, it's all alike. It's unified. It's the same kind of community stepping up and doing this hard work, unifying to this challenge. And it all comes to this. It's unity in our community. Okay? It's getting behind our folks and finding how we can help each other and get through these hard times together. So as we look at our long-term planning, our regional hospitals, our alternate care centers, we look at staffing situations. We look at reduction of workforce. When we look at those things, we got to look at that both not only as a Buncombe County, but we got to look at it from a regional standpoint. We are the regional health care hub of Western North Carolina. So I heard today, just coming into this meeting, how other patients are being moved from other hospitals to our region for specialized care. Those kind of things are going to happen, and we're going to have to react to it, lean forward, and be very proactive. And so, so far, I'm very happy to say that our team has been doing a very good job in being proactive and staying very progressive in what uh, they're doing to, to serve our community. But let's talk about some hard things. Let's talk about work reduction and what that looks like. We lose 40% of the workforce in EMS. Are we prepared for that? Well, when I took this job, we wasn't as prepared as we are now, okay? Through the help of AB Tech, through the help of our community partners stepping up, it all looks good. Right now, we're seeing 20, 25% reduction in call volume this week, okay? But last week, it was peaked, okay? The weeks before that, the last month I've been here, it's been peaked. And so to meet that demand, you know, is huge, but we're going to have this workforce and we're going to step up, we're going to continue this just-in-time training. But one of the things I ask you all to help me do is to outreach to our primary care physicians that's not part of the HCA system that may be closed. Uh, I ask you all to outreach to any allied health care professionals because we're going to need minute men and minute women when this thing peaks on us. We're going to be able to resource track those. We're working ways right now through the Red Cross and United Way to track that and to build a web page to, to actually embrace that and pull that in. That's going to be really important when we hit that peak that everybody steps up and can kind of meet this challenge together. Uh, again, it's that unity in the community and coming together for a safer Buncombe County. With that, I'd like to thank our commission for leaning forward and being so proactive with the funding, a support of our Mercy Operations Center. I've seen every one of y'all uh, in that center at times being part of our decision making. I appreciate that support. And I ask, uh, open this up if y'all have any questions of me before, before I sit down. But thank y'all. Before you go there, Taylor, I want you to, uh, Max, can you put the slides back up real quick? <clears throat> One of the things that we have done, and go back to slide seven. 
One of the things that we have done, I want you to touch on real briefly, is the regional planning for mass care in our community and what that looks like with the state. I want the community to understand some of the planning that have gone into this effort. Okay. So I just left uh, University of Asheville, or University of North Carolina at Asheville, and there we are look, we've, we've just had meetings with the Corps of Engineers where we're looking at the Sherrill Center of actually setting up a hospital there both for COVID and non-COVID patients because my job is HCA is going to be able to take care of 1,400 patients as a regional care center at the peak of this surge. So that's, that's what they have informed us of, which is outstanding that they're able to do that. But as we've seen in other hospitals, when they reach that peak, if we can decompress all their healthy patients out of that, that allows more room for acute care and for patients that need ventilators and specialized care that only physicians and nurses can, can apply. So we've taught like AB Tech, uh, they're bringing their nursing instructors on board. They're bringing their nursing students, their paramedic students, their instructors. You know, we're looking at ways to bring EMS folks in and, and meet this surge with alternate health care. We're going to be looking to the community to help staff that. We're looking through terms, through the volunteer uh, group, uh, medical assistance group at the state level to pull all that in, validate people's credentialing, and actually surge that capability. Now, AB Tech, right across the street from St. Joseph at the Allied Health Building, has a SIM center as part of their nursing. So these, these beds were already set up, just like a real hospital. We're pulling the mannequins out, okay? We're bringing in the surge capabilities from the Mountain Coalition Preparedness Committee to give us 50 extra beds. So that gives us 100 beds there that's ready to go to decompress the hospital. So the other thing we've done, and this is unfortunate planning that you have to do, is we looked at mass fatality planning. So we've obtained three trailers, refrigerator trailers. We're working with the state and putting together a mass fatality plan that has unified efforts of our whole region together. And most of this stuff, I've had conversations every other day with all of our emergency managers around us in the region and our state partners and the other federal stakeholders. And we're working together this as a regional approach because this is really too big for one county. And COVID doesn't understand a county border. You know, what happens in the region affects everybody. So, Ms. Pendrick, does that answer? Any, any other questions from anybody else? I have a, thank, thank you, um, Taylor and Dr. Mullendore and, and um, Fletch Tove. Um, I first just wanna say, I wanna say, Thank you to all of you for all the work you're doing. Um, I know these are you, people are putting in long days, and they're not just they're not just long. They're they're challenging. They're tough. Um, so, thank you to all of you, to all the people on your teams, to all the teams um, in emergency management services. Of course, everyone in the health community, the doctors and nurses. Um, we have a great and strong medical community in. Um, in Buncombe County, one of the best anywhere. And uh, to the, you know, as was said earlier, to the schools, what the schools have been able to do on such a short time frame in terms of taking care of our kids um, while, while the public schools are not open um, and continuing to learn is really incredible. To where we are today compared to where we were three weeks ago uh, is, is just amazing. So, um, you know, in the, the Updates that have been provided to the community, I get a lot of feedback on, on those from folks who have been watching those over the county's Facebook site and media coverage. And I can't tell you how much great feedback I've gotten and how many people have said that while this is a frightening situation, an unprecedented situation, that as people have watched uh, how the county staff and our partners have been working on this Many, many people have said, I feel really confident in the, the, how the county and other local government units and other partners have come together to work on this. So I just want to say thanks to all of you for what you're doing. We've got a long way to go, but I think um, how everyone has ramped up to focus on this really unusual and unprecedented issue that we're facing is, is really remarkable, and you're all to be commended for it.
Chair, Chairman, I'd like to say one other thing because I'd be very remiss if I didn't mention this. And, and I want to say this because council, uh, uh, a couple of councilmen asked me, or going back to South Carolina, I'm using councilmen, but a couple of commissioners asked me about this, about our detention center preparedness. Sheriff's done an outstanding job. He's put our tent up, out to triage people ahead. He has worked with Dr. Mullinder and public health to actually get a plan together to isolate and quarantine people as they move through. That's something you're not seeing throughout the United States, and that's a best practice. And I just want to mention how well that is going and how that kind of proactive things, just like the long-term care facilities is also. Awesome. But I also want to do a special shout out to the Buncombe County Fire Chiefs, especially Ron Cole, for all the hard work that he's done. Uh, and I had that on my notes and the glare kind of blinded me here, but I just want to make sure I thank all those people that's behind us making this successful. But again, thank y'all. Thank, thank you. Um, I, do have one, I do have one question. Maybe Dr. Mullendore might be the best one to field it. You know, so you mentioned the, um, you know, the, uh, there's a finite number of testing kits. That's not something we've been able to do, you know, across the board, but that efforts are focused on the uh, populations that are especially vulnerable. So I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit more detail around that in terms of um, with finite resources we have, you know, what it, how, how thorough is our current capacity to do that kind of focus testing in uh, nursing homes or long-term care facilities and similar situations where the concern is the greatest? Right. So um, when, because um, it's happening, like we, we have had reports of of symptomatic residents and staff at some of our long-term care facilities. That's a new development over the past day or so. And I have to say these facilities have done a great job immediately isolating the individual, contacting us. Many of these facilities have testing supplies in their facility and have had staff who have collected the tests. And then we facilitate getting those tests to the state lab um, where we know there is, uh, you know, maybe a 48 to 72 hour turnaround time. Um, and so we're working, again, we're in collaboration with them. If they don't have the supplies, we'll provide the supplies. And so we have a sufficient um, um, quantity at this point. We've requested, we continue to request supplies from the state lab. They have sufficient quantity at this point. I would say the state, um, you know, in, in a call we had today with them, I mean, we're we're all trying to figure this out together, right? To figure out what is the best way to use the, the supplies we have, to make sure that we have a thorough assessment of the situation and are able to um, identify and isolate those who are ill and then quarantine and protect those who haven't yet showed symptoms. So I, I feel like at this point, um, uh, you know, our, we have sufficient capacity within Health and Human Services to um, meet the needs, and if we don't, the state um, lab is very responsive. Um, again, though, like what we've seen in Henderson County, um, and the guidance of the state is, is adaptable. Like in an ideal world, um, we'd want to test everybody in a facility. But that sometimes would take hundreds of tests, and is that not? If that's not possible, then we have to be realistic and allocate tests to those who are sick. Um, I don't know. I could go on and on, but right. is that right. does that answer your question? I feel like mm -hmm. um, we have sufficient quantity now. We're continuing to re um, uh, support our you know once our inventory, and that the state is very responsive to our requests. So, so it sounds like at a high level that the current approach with those populations is to try to test people who have symptoms. There's right. not resources to test everyone in those right. communities, but to for folks who have some evidence that they might be sick to try right. to get tests for those folks. Right, to confirm that this is in fact mm -hmm. COVID-19 and then what we call cohort, right? So sick residents, Whoops, six res residents are put on a separate wing or isolated from other people. Separate staff is assigned to that, those individuals, so that they're not cross-mingling between sick and well residents to really try to limit um, the potential for transmission. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, in an ideal world, if we had enough tests, we would want to test everybody in those facilities. Chairman, I got a, got a couple comments. I want to thank the uh, 
the staff for a, an amazing job. I would have loved to have been at you know every one of the, of the briefings, but it didn't take but a couple for me to just be impressed and amazed, and you know, and how all of you are holding up. Um, um, you know, I want to take this opportunity to thank our our county manager, who's you know, along with a lot of other staff, is putting in just a, a lot of time. But I also want to take the, this opportunity to uh, to thank the community. Um, uh, everywhere that I have been, and the people that I have talked talked to, uh, it has amazed. Well, it's amazed me a little bit, but I've always had a lot of confidence in the in the. Uh, in, in our county and the mountain culture and you know how we all just come together um, when we need to. Uh, I want to thank the, um, the you know the the frontline business folks that are out there doing their best to manage through the guidance from the state and and ourselves and and how they they many of them did not wait on Buncombe County to give guidance they went out and made their place a safe place for their people before we ever uh, asked them to do, um, you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, I'm grateful to the pastors and, and all uh, the, the churches that are out there that have figured out a, a way to, to work within this and, and get their message out, and I'm grateful for them. Um, thankful for all the takeout. I, if you could see the hands, I'd ask for hand raises back there, and everybody would probably raise their, their hand for those that are, that are finding a way to work. Uh, and and get meals and I noticed the 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 times that we have done it that it that it has meant more at our at our family when we have done that and we've brought that food back and we've been able to to buy that meal and been able to this is my p petition for them if you have it give them a big tip you know and uh, you know even today we had an opportunity to do that and uh, but I'm thankful for all all of those people. Um, my family will tell you I am an eternal optimist. I look forward to good days in Buncombe County as we work through this. Gets on their nerves a little bit every now and then, but uh, but I'm grateful for for everything that you're doing, and I'm also very grateful for this community and and how they're trying to stay ahead of whatever guidance they may be may be getting and how we're working through that. And people are waving at each other we're keeping our distance but they're 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 friendly and waving at each other and we'll we'll continue to do that and get through this but thank you all for what you're doing mr chairman if i may yes sir i just want to echo a little bit there um fletch and dr mullendore your briefings y'all y'all are the one there's others that are there but you two are the ones that are there every day and the way you go and explain it and all that i want to say thank you because it is it is, it is explained in a way where people can understand that, and I want to thank you. To the rest of our staff, I mean, you, you, your, your work life has been disrupted. Some of you are at home. Some of you are in your offices doing other things. Some of you are at the EOC, and I think it's amazing that, that you still could present a, a, a budget and all that. So, so you're really working hard. But let's, I want to speak for the community a little bit. The, there was a 13-year-old boy yesterday, and, and unfortunately, I, I don't remember his name, Charles Hope. Charles Hope. He brought snacks to the EOC yesterday, brought, and, and they were healthy snacks too. So they were, they were all healthy snacks. And in his letter, you know, he, he quoted some scripture. But one of the things he said is, is he said that my mom said that everybody could do something, and this is my something. And I thought, you thought about, I mean, it, it, it literally brought joy and smiles to a bunch of people yesterday. So if if Charles is out there, hey, I want to thank you and and so, but good job, staff, and just we'll get through it. Uh, I, I believe we we're going to get through it. So, thanks, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you all for the updates this evening, and uh, thanks for again for all that you're doing and. Um, carry forward and as said we're going to get through this and thanks to you we're going to get through it better a lot better than we than we would have otherwise so all right let's uh move on to the next agenda item uh that is a public hearing on the one it's not a public hearing we already did a public hearing on this didn't we no. 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 oh sorry we scheduled a public hearing we have to schedule to vote to schedule a public hearing all right so we'll have the public hearing and then we can vote on this item tonight that's right all right so we'll start off with tim love and then we'll hold the hearing or actually, we'll 
This is just unique circumstances. We, we've, we've. <laughs> Go ahead. Everything's different. Yeah. Um, good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, this evening, we, we are going to have a public hearing on the One Buncombe Fund. Uh, a few logistics as we get started. So we'll lead with the public hearing. Um, again, we reviewed much of this content at, our, at your last board meeting, but this is the official public hearing, which is a requirement for economic development appropriations. You've seen a lot of this content, but I'm gonna go through it again because again, it's a public hearing and I wanna make sure the public has an opportunity to see the same material. Um, additionally, uh, there is a budget amendment that's required. Um, once the public hearing is concluded, Jennifer Barnett will come up and present the budget amendment to you. So those are some of your logistics as we get started. But uh, nonetheless, so the public hearing for One Buncombe, a COVID-19 rapid relief fund. Uh, background and request. Uh, so at the March 24th meeting, uh, you, uh, the Board of Commissioners voted to create the One Buncombe Fund. Um, additionally, in Bullet 2, uh, you authorized the notification of a public hearing. And so that notification, you know, it's posted in the newspaper. It says 10 days from now, uh, the Board of Commissioners will review an economic development appropriation. So that's what happened at Mar March 24th. Um, as a reminder, um, One Buncombe, it's a rapid relief fund, so it's a donation fund, so people can donate to the fund. It's also a way of providing relief within the community uh, for individuals as well as small businesses impacted by COVID-19. Uh, the request today, and I'll, I'll reiterate this at the end, um, is the Board of Commissioners approval for a rev resolution authorizing uh, the $200,000 economic development appropriation. So that's the action I'm gonna ask you for at the end of the presentation. Um, again, we've been through this, but so the public can hear it, the need. Um, since the outbreak, thousands of jobs have been reported as furloughed or lost or in peril. Uh, we know that to be true. Um, we know that additionally, there's lots of programs at the federal and state level that exist to help people that have lost their jobs but many folks um, at the individual level may not be eligible for those programs. Uh, so the example is kind of the independent contractor. I know the guidance is evolving at the state and federal level, but uh, we wanted to make sure no one was falling through the cracks. Um, additionally, we know that there's programs for small businesses. Uh, the issue there is we wanted to make sure that we could provide support uh, while these small businesses were waiting for small business administration loans to come through. Um, additionally, our uh, local Chamber of Commerce uh, did a survey, and I'll present some of that data to you. And, you know, at the time of the survey, we had something like 500-plus employers. And when asked, you know, how are you responding to COVID-19, the responses were grim. Uh, and you can see those displayed on, on the screen. 32% uh, said that they were going to close their business, and 26% said they were going to furlough employees. You know, if you do quick math on that, from about two weeks ago, you know, 32% of 511, you know, you're talking about 150 businesses talking about closing. Um, on the right, you know, we asked businesses, what are you concerned about? What are your primary concerns? Uh, number one was cash flow assistance. How do I keep my doors open? How do I make payroll? Uh, but additionally, if I do have to lay off folks, what happens to them? And so those were the top two things that we heard back from the business community. And in response to that, you know, we developed this one bunkum program, which you uh, voted to start at your March 24th meeting. So what is one bunkum? A reminder, it's a partnership. Uh, it includes all of our local governments, additionally members of our business community, as well as other community partners like Land of Sky. Uh, one bunkum is first and foremost a relief program. This exists to help people that are suffering currently because of COVID-19. Those could be individuals unemployed because of COVID-19 or small businesses impacted. Uh, third, and very importantly, and we need to continue to push this in any channels we can, it's a donation platform. Can't do this by ourselves, and so we're asking for help from individuals. Uh, give what you can if you can. And we're asking for help from businesses, and we're also asking for help from foundations. How does it work? Uh, so we've set up a platform where folks can donate. I'm sure you've seen that at this point. Uh, those funds are then allocated by the board of directors of the One Buncombe program. Um, and that allocation is between the two major programs, the individual program and the small business program. The decisions about who, uh, which individuals and which small businesses, those are all administered by the folks that do the work. 
and that's my third bullet. So funds are administered by entities that specialize in direct assistance or small business lending. This is the idea that we're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're going to leverage those that already do the work. Uh, regarding our individual support model, so to be eligible, you have to be unemployed due to COVID-19. Uh, this isn't for folks that were unemployed prior to COVID-19. Uh, how will the funds be used? Uh, life essential uh, needs. So, you know, utilities, uh, mortgages, rent, like things that you need to get, get by in your daily life. Um, this is modeled on our direct assistance program from our HHS uh, department. And so that model is that we pay directly to service providers. We don't pay to individuals. The program is administered uh, by, again, our Department of Health and Human Services. And so, you know, these folks are used to taking these types of requests and helping folks navigate the system to understand what programs they're eligible for, aside from one bunkum, because we want to make sure we're providing the full wraparound services to those that are coming in. Our small business model, um, again, uh, focused on small businesses. These are defined as uh, businesses with less than 50 employees. Uh, usage of funds, it's for business operations, payroll, AP, how do you keep your doors open as a business? The model is low interest loans uh, with no payments for six months. Uh, the design here, this is a bridge loan program. So how do we get from point A to point B? Point B being SBA loans, disaster relief loans are available for you. And so you can migrate to that product. This isn't meant to be a long-term loan product. This program is administered by Mountain BizWorks. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Matt Raker is with us in the back right corner. He's waving. Um, if you have any specific questions about the program, what they're doing, uh, I'll ask Matt to come join us and talk through that. Uh, but Mountain BizWorks, you know, they're, they've been in our community for 20 plus years. They do this exact type of work on a day-to-day -day basis. So they were a natural partner for us. They also specialize in commercial loans, uh, which was a key for why we're working with them. And additionally, you know, they had loan officers ready to roll on day one to sort of get this program off the ground because time was of the essence. Uh, how will One Buncombe be governed? Uh, you're familiar, but as a reminder, uh, all funds come into the Buncombe County Service Foundation, uh, which is a 501c3 um, that serves as our fiduciary for all of these donations. Service Foundation has been around for years. This isn't new to us. It's uh, where a lot of our donations go. In terms of governance, there is a board of directors, nine members from the community uh, representing uh, sort of different experiences in our community, uh, different subject matter expertise, et cetera. Again, uh, the individual program is administered by our Health and Human Services Department, the small business program by Mountain BizWorks. This is a quick snapshot of the One Buncombe board members. So you can see there's nine members. Um, in the middle, uh, we list what organization they're with. Uh, you can see that some of these folks are retired. Um, that's a strategic decision. These folks have more time to invest in the One Buncombe Board. Um, and also on the right, you can see the roles. So we have three officers, a chair, a treasurer, and a secretary. Um, you can see that there's a number of local government reps on this list. So, you know, from Buncombe County, we've got our finance director, Don Warren, who serves as our treasurer on the One Buncombe Board. Additionally, Philip Hardin, uh, who manages our or is the director of our economic services program so the direct assistance program needed that expertise um, also Sybil Tate who is in, in the room with us today as well and has been instrumental in sort of getting this program s stood up uh, from the city you can see uh, Richard White assistant city manager um, there's also a additional folks here we wanted to make sure that we had business representation so Kit Kramer is representing the chamber uh, you can see uh, Suzanne DeFerry uh, represents kind of a former, like a banking kind of expertise. Again, retired because we needed someone that could devote time to this. We have a small business owner, uh, Guadalupe. Uh, David Bailey, former CEO of the United Way. And then Brad Galbraith, who represents uh, the development community. So this is kind of our, our board of directors. Again, time was of the essence, and we, we put these, plays, these folks into these roles to move quickly. Uh, so that we could get funds on the ground as soon as possible. Uh, new information for y'all and uh, for the community as well. So status update, how are things going with One Buncombe? So three big questions that we've been asked. Um, there's many more, but we'll get to that. Um, so how many people have applied for direct assistance? Um, as of Tuesday morning, 1,662 
individual requests for direct assistance. That's a really big number. Um, additionally, out of those 1,662, 480 have been processed. So over 25% we've gotten through. Um, and of that 480, uh, 100, uh, right over $100,000 has been dispersed um, based on those requests. Uh, something I'd add on these requests is that, you know, not all requests are, um, are the same. Sometimes people just have questions, and so those get closed. Uh, sometimes people are uh, not eligible for whatever reason. Um, and so that 480, that, that includes some of that. Um, I'd also add that, you know, and kudos to our, our staff, they've ramped up. So we started with nine people uh, processing claims, and now we've got 20 people uh, devoted to this process. So that, that shows you kind of how we've ramped up to meet demand because it is huge. Yeah, um, and for the public to know, that's county staff, right? That's correct. These that's, are people already working for us. That's right. Great job. Yep, they've, they've done a really nice job and uh, d done the best they can, but they, they understand the importance of timely support. So in terms of how many businesses have applied for loans, you know, these numbers change all the time, but, you know, just in our first week, 71 applications. Again, really big number. Um, Mountain BizWorks uh, was able to get five loans out the door, um, working at risk, I would add, um, sort of putting their own capital up uh, to make sure they were meeting the need as they waited for additional funds to come in based on public hearings and things like that. Um, but, you know, as I understand it, Mountain BizWorks is on track to get another 20 loans out the door um, this week, maybe next. So, the, you know, they're scaling up to meet the need, doing exactly what they were asked to, which is create a bridge loan product to help people that need it today, not in two weeks. Um, how much money is in the fund? Um, I highlighted here, because this is super important, you know, 280 donations uh, from folks in the community, just individuals. There's a tracker on the One Buncom website, so you can look every day. I check it probably every five minutes, because I'm that kind of person. Uh, but, you know, those 200 uh, donations have turned into $64,000 um, in donations just from the public at large. Uh, we've also received uh, great donations from, you know, some of our, our larger entities. And so our total count is closer to $725,000. It's probably more than that at this point, but uh, this is the last number I saw. So in the fund, about 725, uh, of which 64,000 comes from our individual donations. That's just member of the communities, uh, members of the community trying to help out, which is really great to watch. Um, if you're someone who hasn't donated, I would remind you that there's 280 people that beat you to the punch, so you should probably get on that. But that's our quick status update. Uh, information comes in every day. This is a picture of the website. Uh, you can see the One Buncombe logo. There's the One Buncombe web address, which is very easy for those listening, www.onebuncombe.org. Uh, you can donate. You can also apply for relief there. Um, just you know, a, f a few words that you've probably heard already, but I, I like to re reiterate. You know, these are the moments that define communities, and ours will be de defined by its willingness to help one another. It's this spirit that has driven the creation of the One Buncombe Fund. And most importantly, thanks to everyone dedicating themselves to public service and leadership during these times. Shifting back to the request, and if there's any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask if there's any questions and be glad to address those and then we can get back to the public hearing. But any questions from the board, anything you'd like to hear from anyone here? So I got two. Go ahead. Real quick. Um, one is on the individual qualifications. Looks like I just did some quick math, averaging two hundred dollars a a request for the for the for the grant. Um, how are you? How are they handling that? I mean, the, the applications. How are just people just calling in, and are most of the requests, you know, legit and being funded? Not legit. It's not the right word, but but meeting the qualifications. Are they uh, most of the requests? Pardon me. Hey, I'm on, but I got to get closer. So, um, so most of the requests that are coming in are they? Uh, uh, are most of the requests that are coming in being being processed at the grants? Yeah. And, the, and the, the second question I'd have would be for Mountain BizWorks, just to kind of give us a, a little an idea of how you uh, 
uh, you know, the first five loans and 71 applications, what you're seeing and what the need is and how you're, how you're working through that. Just, in a, just give us a little update on that. That's great. So uh, Philip's team uh, tracks all of these requests. That 480, um, that could be, you know, requests that were closed. You know, this is just a question. You're not actually looking uh, for funding. Be glad to get uh, those folks to bring in some, some hard data because they are tracking it. Um, I, I don't have that for you today. But what I can offer is, you know, out of those requests, you know, in terms of, you know, where these, where these folks previously employed, um, as expected, we're seeing massive impact to our, you know, our, our hospitality industry. Thank you. Um, that's been, I think, Philip quoted something like 75% of the requests are coming from that industry. Um, additionally, like the majority of the requests are related to housing. Um, it's how do I continue to pay my rent? Um, and as you know, we've been, a lot of our utility providers um, have been, like, uh, not shutting off service. Um, so that's one of the requests that we don't necessarily feel that much. But that's a, a breakdown. But uh, you did have a question for Matt, so I'd, I'd ask Matt to come up. Good evening. Uh, Matt Raker with Mountain BizWorks. Um, so first of all, kudos to the Buncombe County team for helping to put this together, and they've really done a great job in getting the word out uh, as well throughout the community uh, and all the other partners. Um, we're up to 117 uh, applications uh, as of a couple hours ago. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> just continues to be really strong uh, need uh, for this program. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, just the, the level of resilience that's in our, our local business community of how they're working together to come up with creative ways to stay open, to partner. Um, a lot of the requests are really focused around the, this is helping them address some immediate needs where they can keep some employees on that they might not have been otherwise been able to, that were kind of critical staff to, to give them a little breathing room to adjust and adapt to the new situation as well as uh, things like rent utilities and and some of those kinds of things they need to keep uh, to keep the business open so that as we uh, tackle the covid challenge they'll still be there to be able to rebound as quickly as we can uh, coming out of this so um, great impact and uh, we do look forward to announcing another 20 or so uh, closings tomorrow in fact see see matt buried the lead there <laughs> Um, so, you know, one thing I would say for those listening, um, you know, we're working through this program. This is new to us, new to all of us. And so as questions come up, send them to us and we'll, we'll figure it out. I mean, that's been a learning process and we, we've addressed some obstacles that we ran into, but, um, but that's it. Any other questions? So before, uh, you open the public hearing, I, I turn to Mr. Fru, uh, regarding our resolution. He has a, a quick, um, addition he'd like to add, uh, to clarify rather. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, just a bit of house cleaning. It appears that the version of the resolution that made it on the website is not the final draft. So just to make some important findings, I'd like to just read the three uh, main points after the now, therefore, this board determines as follows. One, pursuant to provisions of uh, NCGS 158 7.1 and Chapter 166A, the North Carolina Emergency Management Act, this board approves appropriating and spending from the county's general fund amounts to make appropriations of $200,000 to Buncombe County Service Foundation. Number two, this board approves entering into an agreement by and between Buncombe County and Buncombe County Service Foundation for its administration of these funds. And three, that this board finds and determines that the that these efforts to provide low-cost bridge funding and to provide general assistance to limit job losses until businesses and individuals can qualify for longer-term disaster funding from SBA and others will further the economic interest of the county in numerous ways by creating a mechanism to increase and maintain population, taxable property, employment, industrial output, and small business prospects in Buncombe County. And I'll get that corrected version to the clerk. And if there's any other questions, I'll try to answer those. Great. Thank you, Mr. Fru. Is that all? That's it. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Tim and Matt. Let's go ahead and open the um, public hearing. Uh, again, this is very unusual. There's no members of the public here, but we have solicited public input on this public hearing. 
over email, but I think the protocol is that we should still open the hearing at a specific time, which is, I'll do that now at 624 p.m. I'm going to read the public comments that we've received for uh, the One Buncombe Fund economic development issue. Uh, the first comment was from Jan Getz in Asheville. The comment was, uh, I'm in favor of the $200,000 general fund going to the One Buncombe Emergency Relief Fund. The next comment was from Harris Wagner. Comment was, I endorse the $200,000 of Buncombe County General Fund to help fund One Buncombe. The next, the last comment was from Greg Borum, uh, who works with Children First uh, Communities and Schools, Buncombe County. Comment was, thank you for your leadership around the One Buncombe Fund to support individuals and small businesses during this crisis. The following are specific questions and comments. First, the description for funds for individual reads, funds will be used for life essential needs caused by COVID-19 public health crisis, such as electric, electric bills, deposits, fuel oil, kerosene, natural gas, propane, wood, mortgages, overnight lodging, et cetera. Rent payments are not spe named specifically. Will these funds be available for rent? If not, please reconsider as a way to stem the tide of evictions that may follow this crisis. Number two. The website reads, HHS employees will screen applicants to ensure all other potential sources are leveraged, including public assistance programs, such as unemployment insurance, and the services of our community partners. The assistance worker will also make referrals to human service partners and programs to assist the client in alleviating their immediate crisis. How quickly can individuals expect the screening to be completed? Will it take into account the new federal relief package, including the rebate payments? How will, how will the existing stay on eviction proceedings and utilities shutoffs impact decisions or necessary documentation of bills individuals will need to produce? Third, I understand that citizenship status is not a consideration for application. Thank you. Making funds available to all who call our county home indeed lives up to the Title I Buncombe. This assistance it's critical as the recent federal relief packages do not fully fund, uh, do not fully extend benefits and assistance to cover our neighbors that have mixed status households or have filed taxes using an ITIN. Fourth, I cannot find the names of the nine member oversight board for one Buncombe on the website. Who are the members and what public reporting and oversight will be available? Thanks again for lever leveraging this public private partnership to support individuals and businesses. All right, so those are all the comments. I'll close the public hearing at 627. Um, just following up on one of the questions, this is available to help cover rent for folks who don't own their own home, right? Yeah. Absolutely, rent is included. Right, thank you so much. All right, commissioners, any other questions or is there a motion to approve, oh, actually, we'll cl close the public hearing. All right, so is there a motion to approve the resolution as outlined in the packet with the additional language as uh, described by Mr. Frew. So, so moved. Move. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Yeah, at the same time. Any further discussion? Just a comment, Chairman. Should, should we, if the rent is not specific on the website, should we just make sure that that's added to it just so we don't run into more emails in the future? We can add that. I believe it says rental assistance, but we'll double check and make sure okay. that's added. Yep. We'll take care of it. We'll make sure it's on the website. Yep. Clear. Okay. Good question. Mr. Whiteside. Yes, I'd sir. like to make a comment on one question you pointed sure. out. On the uh, board that will be administering this, you know, I've worked on a lot of boards in the community in my time. These people on this board, I've worked with all of them except maybe one. And I don't know who selected the board, but you did an excellent job because it really is people who cover the community, they care about the community, and they will do a good job in administering this. Thank you. I want to give special thanks to Tim and Sybil who have worked incredibly hard and from my perspective as a professional fundraiser, the work that you all put into making this happen has been absolutely incredible while ensuring ethics 
surrounding the fundraising component of it. That's one of the most important pieces of fundraising, particularly in a time of crisis. And I want to acknowledge that work that you all have done. And I also want to thank my commissioner colleagues who um, found out that maybe fundraising wasn't quite so hard and scary this week because they also took the opportunity to reach out to some local businesses. And we've gotten some yeses and some maybes and some businesses who are thinking they need to wait and see what's happening so that they can keep their own employees on the payroll so that they don't have to utilize the one bunkum fund. So we will see where that goes. And I wanna also challenge them to also make a gift if you haven't. And April 24th, that would be the absolute best birthday gift for me is to see that fund hit a million dollars. So those of you who are watching, please go to onebunkum.org and make a gift to help those in need right now. This is really an exciting time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Edwards. Anyone else? All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Next up is consideration of a budget amendment for funding of Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools for the provision of meal services to students. Good evening. Um, I would like to recognize um, that Dr. Tony Baldwin, Dr. Bobby Short, and uh, new Superintendent Jean Freeman are, are here and available um, to answer any questions um, related to this. Um, but the budget amendment we are bringing forward to you this evening um, is related to a request from Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools um, for funding assistance in the amount of um, $86,863. I um, want to recognize that, um, as has been stated many times, that Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools have stepped up and been providing mill sites um, locally in our community um, in this time of need. And the request um, is for funding to support and pay the overtime portion of personnel um, during the spring break week. Um, where the staff would have otherwise um, not been um, working. Um, I know that uh, their dedication um, is represented there, and so this request is assistance to be able to help fund um, a, the, what would be the, effectively the overtime portion of those salaries. So the budget amendment request um, is to um, appropriate from fund balance a total of 86,863 um, into um, our ledger of education support. Uh, the independent request were for Buncombe County Schools of 75,863 and for Asheville City Schools, $11,000. All right, thank you. All right. Commissioners, are there any questions or a motion? I'll move approval. Second. For the one Buncombe, yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. So I do want to make sure, um, because the second budget amendment that is on the new business agenda does have to do with the one Buncombe fund. Um, so following your um, appropriation of the um, economic and uh, incentive dollars of 200000 200, we need to do, to do a technical budget amendment for that. Um, and so that would be um, additionally an appropriation of 200000 from fund balance. And the expenditure side for that is an interfund transfer expense from the general fund um, because that enables us to transfer the money from the general fund to uh, the service foundation in order to um, add the, that funding there. Okay, great. Is there a motion uh, as outlined by the staff? So move. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Thank Making you. sure we got that covered. Chairman, just comment, kudos to uh, the city schools and the uh, Buncombe County schools. And I had a member of my church that was retired and went out. And I think she, I think she's 81 if I'm overstating her age. I'm her Sunday school teacher, so she's going to wear me out when we get back together. But uh, just, uh, you know, driving a bus, delivering everything, and just amazing. I mean, I, I hearing people that 
their kids are not in school or they're getting ready to go to school, but they're getting a, they're getting a little family meal and it's meaning a lot to the community. So I just wanna thank y'all very much for what y'all are doing. Uh, yes, I've got to see that hands-on going in some of the district out there and just watching the kids come in on their bicycles. And I mean, it, it's like they know that the church bell or the school bell has rung and here they come out and it it, it is enjoying to see that them kids are getting that lunch. And I mean, it's done an excellent job because I mean, everything's there and on the weekends or Friday, they've got their breakfast, lunch for Saturday and Sunday. It, it was just great to see that. Right. Thank you, commissioners. All right, um, we have a couple of board appointments to consider. Uh, the first is the uh, Nursing Home Committee, Community Advisory Committee. Uh, there's three positions open. We have three uh, reappointments. You need a motion? Sure. I move that we approve the three, uh, Patty, Turbell, Stephen, Ide, and Nancy Kiffin. Great. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then on the audit committee, there's one member uh, who is applying for a second term as well. I move to approve Kendra Ferguson. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, we now come to public comment. As with the public hearing, there's no members of the public uh, at this meeting, but we have asked for public comment uh, to be submitted over email, and we've received several, and I will read them now. The first comment is from Leslie Humphrey. Hello, thank you for making the county agenda meetings available. I appreciate that Buncombe commissioners voiced rules stricter than the governor's, and I feel we are safer and ahead of most communities in actions we can take to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The reason I'm writing is to urge the commissioners to mandate the wearing of masks in public. Somehow we can make it a stylish, irresponsible, Asheville cool statement of solidarity and hope. I hope this will become a national trend, a requirement eventually, but let's go ahead and stay ahead of the slow to respond, okay? Thank you. Keep doing what's right, even if it's not popular. Create a web page where citizens can share their designs and photos of original masks. The next comment is from Mike Tao from Arden. The virus shutdown does not pertain to construction work, evidently, but it should. Near me is an unoccupied house that is daily that has daily six to eight workers all together constructing. The workers have a lot of contact with each other. The workers could give themselves and others the virus is just if just one worker is infected and the workers travel to and from work and get and go to the ATM to go get fast food. One infected worker can cause the virus to spread. Construction is not a necessity, I think, and the virus business shutdown should also pertain to construction. Perhaps construction by one lone worker could be allowed as an exception. Please consider this to better ensure the safety of the county. The next comment is from Jan Getz from Asheville. I'm in favor of the $86,863 to the Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools to cover overtime for workers providing meals. Thank you for your leadership during this most difficult time. Next comment is from David Bradley from Leicester. Why have I not heard anything from my February 23rd, 2020 complaint about verbal abuse and property damage during the January 2020 by county social workers? The acts were against an 84 year old lady suffering from anxiety disorder and dementia. The victim who lives in Asheville required medical attention due to panic attacks from the event and the two entry doors were damaged. All county commissioners were alerted to the acts by the social workers. I have power, I have power of attorney for the victim. The next comment is from Harris Wagner. I, en I endorse amending uh, the budget amendment of $86,863 to cover workers' meals at delivery sites. The need for widespread testing should be more apparent by now. Our health director needs to get their head out of the sand. Just because there are only 31 cases in Buncombe County does not mean there are no cases. According to a study published recently, through the University of Austin, Texas, the probability of Buncombe County having an epidemic is currently 99%. How can you sit idly by and hope that people are keeping enough distance? To not have widespread testing will cost people their lives under your gross negligence. 
Just because our federal government has un been unwilling to act appropriately does not mean we have to follow suit. We have the resources locally and statewide to implement this. Please mobilize. The blood of innocent American lives will be on your hands. The title of the study in question is Probability of Current COVID-19 Outbreaks in All U.S. Counties by Emily Javin. This study was seen in the recent New York Times article, Does My County Have an Epidemic? Estimates Show Hidden Transmission. Thank you for your time. Please put in place widespread testing. It's the only way forward. Uh, the last comment is from a um, citizen who did not provide their name. Yes, I'd like to leave a comment for the county meetings on the exemptions to the stay at home rule. I'm wondering how the county decides who gets an exemption to stay at home. I talked to my boss and was informed that he could get an exemption for his sign company. And I was told that although I'm not in the high risk category and he knows that he can't keep the six foot rule at work, that we will be going back to work next week so he can get his money from the government to pay our salary. It's nice to see that the county is watching out for his interests instead of ours. Thank you. Uh, those are all of the comments that we received. I have a couple of announcements. Um, at April 21st at 3 p.m., the county commissioners will have our next pre-meeting at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. And on April 21st at 5 p.m., the county commissioners will have the next regularly scheduled meeting at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. I do not believe there's a need for any closed session this evening. Is that right, Ms. Hockaday? Great. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs>